The Spider by F. McDermott Christmas Eve in Cornwall of all counties decided to have snow. Thick, unhurried snowflakes began to outline the trees overhanging the little lane in which I found myself. I was lost. Because the lane would lead to some sort of habitation, I decided to go down it. Towards its lower end I found a building which had obviously been a mill house. The ancient wheel was still in place. There was a welcome glow of light from one of the windows. So I pressed a bell at the side of the oak door, which was opened by an old man. You are indeed out of your way, he said courteously. Tonight of all nights. You must have a glass of wine before you leave. We entered a large stone flagged room, roofed with huge oak beams. In the open fireplace, logs blazed. On the walls and side tables, the pictures and tapestries and ornaments which were obviously very valuable. As I stopped before a curved niche in the wall, my host's soft, cultured voice remarked, That jeweled Buddha is a rare example of the standing figure, as opposed to the more conventional squatting position. From Mandalay, poor Mandalay, I wonder what Kipling would have said. But we must not get on to politics, must we? He then unhooked a tapestry bag from the wall and handed it to me. That was made by the women folk of one of the hill tribes, Catchins. Perhaps you know, Burma? Yes, I answered, recalling leeches, mosquitoes, Japanese machine gun nests. I certainly do know Burma. And this, reaching out for a curved sword which had been hanging near the bag, and this is... is a catch in da. Don't touch it! His voice was so urgent that I hurriedly withdrew my hand. Please, forgive me. He was again urbane. But you see, I'm blind, and the only way I can be certain of finding things is if I only touch them. Blind? I echoed in astonishment. But you had the light on. But of course that is for the rest of your household. I live alone, but I always light that lamp in case a wayfarer, such as yourself, visitor calls. Please, sit down. I will get you some sherry and a biscuit. The sherry was of the first quality, and as I sipped it, my host warmed his long, thin hands over the leaping flame. A pity, he said suddenly. I would have liked you to share my evening meal. But already your relatives and friends will be getting anxious about you. I laughed. <laughs> I too am a lonely soul. That's why I'm wandering about at Christmas time. I'm often away from my hotel for two or three nights. And the proprietor would only get worried if I didn't eventually turn up to pay his bill. Really? Again, there was a curious shrillness in the old man's voice. Then that settles it. You will not only die, but stay the night. I will show you my treasures. With amazing deftness, he set the table. Shining tumblers, surmounted by white table napkins, were adroitly placed next to cut glass wine glasses. There were silver bowls of fruit and nuts. The meal came up to the promise of its setting. The peas which accompanied the chicken might well have come from a country garden in June. The sauce, served with the Christmas pudding, had the flavour of old brandy. When I had helped myself to port, I had pushed the decanter towards my host. Port is on your right side, I said. May I help you? Thank you, no, he replied. You will have noticed I did not join you in the sherry. Wine disagrees with me, and I seldom take it. There is no reason why I should not provide it for my guests. But surely you don't get many visitors in this isolated spot? I asked. No, oh, not many. Those who do come are sometimes important. For instance, there was the Scandinavian woman. 
tell you of her later. Do try some of these Brazil nuts. They're a fresh consignment and as good as they can be in this country. Of course, to taste a Brazil as it should be tasted, you must eat fresh from the tree. You've been in Brazil? I did quite a bit of exploration out there at one time. I don't know if you've ever heard of a native tribe called the Jivaros. They're in Peru, of course, not Brazil. They held me prisoner for five years. They're the people who cut off their enemies' heads and shrink them, you know. Good Lord, I exclaimed. What an experience. Could they torture you? It depends what you mean by torture. They put me to no physical discomfort. They forced me to take drugs compounded from various vines and trees in the jungle. This is the result of one of them. He motioned with his hand towards his eyes. Did they ever allow you to see any of their head shrinking business? I asked. Is it merely true that the head becomes the size of an orange? He nodded. Oh, yes. Sometimes smaller. I have a couple here. If it conforms with your idea of Christmas merriment, perhaps you might care to look at them. I've always wanted to see one, I exclaimed. Good. Then if you've finished your port, come along. As they're upstairs, I shall have to ask you to carry this candle, unless, of course, you have an electric torch. I had no torch. So, lighting the candle, I followed him, as with assured steps he made his way up an ancient oak staircase. In the room into which he led me, the beams were, if anything, even more massive than downstairs. But here the roof sloped up to a point, vanishing in the dancing shadows cast by the candle. Again there was the resemblance to a museum, and I recognized rare little ivory Netsuki figures from Japan, beautifully carved ivory and ebony chopsticks from China and an astonishing and rather terrifying collection of grotesque Indian gods and goddesses. Here they are, said my host, motioning towards one of the corners. A native drum was flanked on one side by a tall mahogany pipe for blowing poison darts, and on the other by long arrows fletched with brilliant coloured bird's feathers and tipped with sharpened bone. On the taut skin of the drum were two tiny human heads one much smaller than the other. With an appearance almost of reverence, the old man picked them up. Let us sit on the bed while we examine them, he said. They had a party for the school children up in the village this afternoon, and borrowed all my small bedroom chairs. I shall probably have to worry them for a week before I get them back. With a curious tingling at the back of my scalp, I accepted from his hand the smaller of the two heads, which was little bigger than a billiard ball, yet had perfect features. You know, a lot is said about secret processes and so on, he said. But really, the whole thing is quite simple. They have to cut the scalp before they can remove the skull. Then they sew it up again, forming a kind of bag, and fill that tightly with sand. Most of the rest of the business is simply a matter of smoothing the features with very hot stones, which causes them to shrink proportionately. That one is a gypsy child. And it took me in all only about three hours to do it. <laughs> you mean they actually allowed you to take part in the proceedings? I asked, incredulously. Oh, dear, dear me, no! They would have killed me promptly if I had touched anything connected with that ceremony. Even the pots in which the heads are placed have to be covered with leaves and must only be seen by the witch doctors. I did that one here. I felt my heart miss a beat. Here, I echoed. Yes. Luckily I have plenty of sand around, and a small quarry actually in my own grounds where there's just the right type of stones. Strange how that child was never missed. Or at any rate, no fuss was made about it. That's why I'm sure it was a gypsy. Now this other one, the Scandinavian woman, caused a frightful uproar. I made the mistake of thinking that because she was a foreigner, no inquiries would be made. But she was a famous authoress. 
and I thought they'd never stop the hullabaloo. Luckily, to avoid publicity, she'd come to Cornwall incognito without leaving her address, and her supposed disappearance took place in Sussex. Otherwise... He shrugged, and reaching out, took the smaller head back from me. By now, I had quite recovered from my self-possession. I was obviously being entertained by a maniac, but he was just a frail old man. Even allowing for the strength said to be possessed by the insane, he was blind, and obviously incapable of doing me harm, provided I remained on my guard. Of course, they're imperfect, he went on. They really ought to have the lips sewn up. The idea is to prevent the dead person's spirit from cursing the one who is doing the shrinking. But the cord has to be left hanging down. They would have looked too awful if I'd used ordinary strength, so I thought it best to leave them unfinished. Quite, I murmured, thinking to humour him. Still, luck is with me. His voice was now a little more than a whisper. I've been so much wanting the set. Child. Woman. Now you come along. In spite of my feeling of physical superiority, this confirmation of a suspicion which had been dawning on me made me decide to act forthwith. The old man was undeniably clever. He might strike me down without the least warning. I would go at once and inform the police. But as I tried to rise, my legs suddenly refused to act, and I sank back heavily on the bed. Just right, said the old man, who had evidently been waiting for this movement on the bed. Six minutes and thirty-five seconds for the legs. In another ten seconds you will be completely stiff. So I advise you to lie down. Like this. Turning, he pressed me back on the bed and I found I had no power to resist. It's one of the most interesting of the Javaro drugs, he went on. They used to make it from a kind of orchid which they gathered on the tops of very high trees. I got away with quite a lot. It has a pleasant flavour, hasn't it? It was in the port, you know. I've often tried it on myself and timed it. The limbs become completely stiff in whatever position they are, just... Six minutes and forty-five seconds after the dose has been taken. Mental faculties are not impaired at all. For some reason, the recovery time varies. Usually it's in the region of two hours. I've never felt any ill effects afterwards. Rather the contrary. He got up and replaced the two small heads carefully on the top of the drum. Then he came back and stroking his chin, looked down on me thoughtfully. There's only one thing I must apologise for, he said, and there was genuine regret in his voice. To get the best results, I must make the severance. While you are still alive, but I can assure you that it will be absolutely painless. The whole body is rendered incapable of feeling by this drug. If it weren't that I need it for my own purposes, I should certainly introduce it to the medical authorities. The Scandinavian woman was not inconvenienced in the least. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll just go make some preparations. My eyes remained immovably fixed on the old beams, disappearing from view in a mass of cobwebs and dust. With a strange calmness, I considered my position. Even if I had been able to talk with the old man, to reason with him, there might have been some hope. But had I been a wax dummy, I could not have been less capable of offering any form of resistance, mental or otherwise. I could see and I could hear. The ticking of a cheap alarm clock on a small table near the bed seemed unnaturally loud, terribly slow. As the minutes passed, I longed for something to happen. Even the return of the old maniac, whose one object in life was now my murder. I tried to move. Quietly, and still with that mental calmness of desperation, I attempted to alter the position of each of my limbs in turn. It was hopeless. Not even a finger would respond. Then, I saw it. 
Oh, one of the biggest spiders I have ever seen in my life. Up there on a beam just above me. Now, for some strange reason, from my earliest childhood, I have had an utterly inexplicable horror of spiders. And although I got through the Burma campaign with nothing worse than a mild dose of malaria, just to run into a spider's web in an ordinary English garden, just to feel it across my face, has always been sufficient to bring on a severe illness which lasts several days. As I saw that huge hairy creature making its way around the beam just above my head, a surge of unreasoning terror swept through me. To be decapitated alive had, I suppose, seemed so fantastic that I cannot say I had felt more than an acute anxiety. But this was different. That loathsome thing might drop on me while I was still unable to move. Almost as if in answer to my thought, I saw it sway backwards and forwards, apparently hang suspended for a fraction of a second, then fall straight towards my head. As it alighted on me, I emitted what would normally have been a loud scream, but which I heard as a gurgle, and simultaneously I brushed it off my face. I am not well enough versed in psychology to explain what had happened. Presumably, the overwhelming primitive horror I had felt had proved sufficiently strong to overcome the effects of the drug. At any rate, in the course of a few seconds, full power of movement had returned to me. Cautiously, I made my way down the stairs again. There was no sign of the old man. He must have been engaged in the domestic quarters of the house. With a great sobbing sigh of relief, I stumbled out into the snow. The moon was now shining brilliantly, and from a nearby tree, an owl hooted. The police sergeant chuckled as he motioned me to the old-fashioned settee which formed the only sitting accommodation in his parlour come police station. <laughs> Sorry you've had the journey for nothing, sir, he said. But he's quite harmless. As batty as you make him, of course. He's even told me that story about the heads. Me? The sergeant patted his ample middle and roared with laughter. But... I began. The sergeant interrupted me with a wave of his hand. It's no good, sir. Don't you worry yourself any more. We took it seriously at one time ourselves. But there never has been a child report missing in this neighborhood. As for that Swedish writer woman, don't you remember her body was washed up on one of the Sussex beaches? A bit smashed up, so the report said. But they hadn't any doubts who it was. Besides... There'd have been somebody missing this end, too, wouldn't there? And what about the bodies? Where there are heads, there are bodies, too, you know, sir. Even he couldn't tell us what he'd done with those. No, it's a well-known form of mania, so I've been told. Like to make themselves feel important. Of course, I suppose we could get him put away, but uh, he's a decent enough old boy, except for this delusion. He gives quite a lot to local charities. And the drug? I asked. The sergeant winked knowingly. It's Christmas time, sir. I don't blame you. I felt pretty paralytic myself sometimes after a Christmas party. And there it ended. Except for newspaper cutting. I clipped that out of the Cornish and Devon Sentinel dated last Friday. It reads, Considerable anxiety is now felt for the safety of Mr. Manuel Rodriguez, the Portuguese scientist at present in Cornwall to study rock formations, who left his hotel in Los Wanak on Tuesday afternoon last, and has not been heard of since. It is known that he intended to visit inland quarries, but though a number of these have been searched, and so on. I can't help wondering what that police sergeant is doing about it. You see, Lost Manor was where I had that strange experience.
Today's story was The Spider by F. McDermott. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thank you ever so much for listening, and until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>